Welcome to Because and Effect, the podcast from the Winnipeg Foundation. My name is Nolan Bicknell, and I'm now joined via Zoom by Joanne Kelly. She is the journalism instructor at Red River College, a book columnist for CBC Radio Weekend Morning Show, and she is actually the book club host of the Winnipeg Foundation's book club. So, Joanne, thank you for joining us. Yay! Glad to be here. On top of all those things, we have to, in, in um, you know, Full disclosure, you were also my instructor back in I was. 2012, I was thinking, is when. So that's almost nine years ago now, which is insane yeah. to think about. Um, so, I mean, you're still an instructor at Red River. What's it been going like? Like, how are, how's COVID uh, at RRC? It's changed things a lot. I mean, the, the fundamentals are always the same, as I'm sure all instructors would tell you. But teaching online... I won't even get into the amount of work it is. Uh, um, There are, I'm finding it such a challenge and it's a challenge that I'm happy to rise to and we're all working on it, but that that face-to-face connection with students is pivotal. Um, As any instructor can tell you, I, when I'm in a classroom, I can see when a student is frustrated, I can Mm -hmm. see when the light bulb goes off. I can see when I need to slow down. I can see when they're excited. I can see when I'm losing them. Um, I can feel the energy. Right. And that's especially with my first years who I've never met in person before. Right. So first semester was just a, just a struggle to get them to talk Mm -hmm. and be comfortable. And, and also, you know, huge concerns about uh, mental health issues. Like these students are, are in for a lot of them coming right out of high school going into college without the supports that would normally I mean the college has huge supports but I mean the the personal in touch right um my second years who I worked with all last year I are off and running they're doing fabulous I'm finding that my first years now that we're into second semester wow we're hitting our groove I just I just wrapped up a class before this interview and I was on fire with the conversation we were having. It was probably the first time since I started this semester, like last September, that the students are just finding their rhythm. They're talking, they're excited, they're engaged, they're taking things I'm saying and, and taking them even further. And so I, you're, I'm i coming into this interview with you actually to get pumped and excited. Beautiful. Well, that was the best part about your class, if I'm speaking honestly, is the conversations that we would have just about either you know things that were in the news or different aspects of the journalism industry itself i really loved having those conversations so yeah and um, and nolan you all like even after you in class i could always count on you to spark a great interesting nuanced discussion and even after you'd be in touch saying oh my god i hope you're talking about this and but right. um and today was great because um i'm working on we're working on city hall stories that impact real people right and it was really important to talk about language. And I was able to pull some sentences from news reports about what was going on in the States. Mm -hmm. So we were able to look at the use of language and how words matter and word choice matters and sentence sentence grammar actually matters when you're trying to convey something and, and you can unconsciously convey meanings. You don't mean to just with a change in grammar. So we, we didn't, we didn't talk about politics, per se, but talking about how those uh, incidents are incidents. That was one of the words I told them not to use. How <laughs> what's happening in the in the States is being covered. Right. Um, so it, it really sparked some really eye-opening discussions about language. Yeah, there's so many magnifying glasses on journalists right now because of the, you know, fake news mantra that has been brought up. How do you how have you approached that with with young Um, new journalists and how have you obviously it's just kind of stay with the fundamentals tell the truth you know like all the yes all the ethical things but what do you do now when that when this is a thing that you have to you know that they're going to come up against yes well we we as you say there's the there's the concrete teaching teaching them um how to check sources how to know what's credible what what credible means right um there's also the fundamentals of being and I, I think this is huge, but just being a decent human being, right? Like the fundamentals of being a curious, engaged, caring and compassionate and empathetic human being um, takes you a really long way in being able to process the world and what you're reading and what you're seeing. So there's a huge 
we, we talk about that a lot. I try to role model it, obviously, and bring guest speakers who role model it and have them read things that, that help them explore that. But bottom line, a lot of my answers to their questions are, well, be a decent human being and it'll work out. <laughs> like yeah. you know, so. Authenticity goes a long way in an interview, right? As long as you are truly interested in someone, it's kind of Im amazing how much they'll tell you. you know, even if you might be in an advers not necessarily adversarial role, but certainly like a opposing forces. How, how, just can you speak generally about the state of journalism right now? Because there's tons of criticisms lobbied at people and it's very hard to be a journalist right now but it's also very um easy to kind of fall into bad habits and you know reporting one thing i was talking about with some co-workers the other day was you know reporting on some, one person tweeted something so all of a sudden this needs to be an article and 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 maybe just what are your general thoughts about how the industry itself is as far as its health and its and its um you know. I would say, and I, I've said this since I, I mean, when I got into journalism 25 years ago, people were saying, oh, it's a dying industry. <laughs> uh, and I would say it's never been more alive. Uh, sure, some of the platforms and for like print, et cetera, may be changing or, um, but journalism at the heart of what journalism is, it's never been more important. It's and the, the, un the unfortunate part is the finances mean it's, it, it's being shuttered on a local level, which is, I, I, I'm a huge, huge advocate of, of the national reporting that's done. It's, but but it, I don't know if it's even as important as the local city council in Flin Flon, right? Like those are the stories that, that are gonna spark the, those are the stories that have impact on my life, on your life. So. In, in terms of how journal, I think it's going through a big shift and all the things that are reflected in society, uh, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, the, the watching journalists of color and indigenous journalists step forward and, and create space that the media needs to create space for those voices and empower them and amplify them. And is that happening? Not necessarily all the time, but that that the clash is happening and that's where change happens, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a really, really important time in journalism. I think it's an exciting time in journalism. Um, I think it's, I, I, I'm, I'm teaching, but I'm also trying to step aside to make room for voices that I, it's not just to make room for those voices, but to, but to learn from them mm -hmm. as well, right? So to, to have those those voices have not just a place at the table, but even, I, I would say even more so that they need, uh, we need to understand the value of the diversity of that, that should be engaging and that the old idea of being neutral and unbiased, we all, we know that's not true. Mm -hmm. And I think in a way, I'm glad that's being shattered. I think people should bring who they are and their experience to their journalism. Desmond Cole is, is, is one of those people who I've learned a lot from reading. And um, so I think there's huge changes in journalism. Yeah. And I think it would be an exciting time to be a young journalist. It's ever changing too. It's ever evolving. It's constantly sort of like breathing and contracting. You kind of there's there's waves that it comes in, and I think a lot of the times the um, the business model gets tied in with the actual work, and they you criticize the business model, and then that people can be like, oh well, you know, you just shun it because it's whatever. Um, so what? I remember talking a lot. We had Paul Simin come in in our in our classes to talk about sort of the business model of things. So how are you seeing that evolve? Like, what are you telling, like what kind of jobs, I mean, Krecom always focused on jobs. So what are you kind of like telling your students now when it comes to the business model side of things? I would argue that, uh, and there's both pros and cons to this, that there are more jobs than ever because instead of a six o'clock newscast or a newspaper that comes out once a day, there's a 24 hour massive, massive internet hole right and the the there's some several cons to that one being the hole gets filled with a lot of inane garbage right um 
but also there's so much room for up and coming journalists. But a lot of that is because <laughs> the top heavy, and I'm not talking management, I'm talking the top heavy, the experienced senior video journalists and reporters are the ones being let go. So there's more money and time and room for the up and coming journalists, but there isn't that men- there isn't necessarily always mm. that mentorship and the people to learn and grow from. So a newsroom might, a newsroom to me ideally should be filled with the people who can mentor and role model, but also the new young and exciting blood, but that, that mm-hmm. need to be, that need to have a framework to learn in. Um, but I think there's a lot of newsrooms now where it's all just people who not, aren't quite sure what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So, so um, there's a, an ever, ever, ever huge need for mentors and, and people to role model and show and teach. For sure. Um, I, I tend to be cons- like, I'm sure you hear lots of your former students, um, you know, asking questions at the pressers for the co- for the, for yeah. Dr. Rusin and things. That's almost all former students. <laughs> that's, that's so cool. Uh, my concern is, you know, you have certain reporters, I'm not going to name any names, but certain reporters are very dedicated to the COVID every day. They're tweeting out the deaths, the COVID numbers, the, the, the quotes and everything do you include in your um, instruction how to uh, work li- like work-life balance for a journalist is pretty much how is that even possible? Because you have to be constantly plugged in to some pretty um, traumatic yeah. information. So, so what do you, what do you say? Nolan, I got it. I have a couple things I want to say on that. And, and one is we had, if, if we're not naming names, but I love this guy, so not naming names and not be not to hide his identity, but we had a former student who's covering it nonstop. Is it Scott? Yeah, it's Scott. Okay, yeah. Scott Billy, who's, a, who's doing a, a fabulous job, and he was a sports. He is a sports reporter, but he mm-hmm. got, of course, moved. There's no sports yeah, happening. Yeah. Got moved from the sports <laughs> beat to the COVID beat, and he's been doing a fabulous job. And I've seen his growth as as he digs into these stories and these numbers and I've seen the toll it takes on him and I had him come in and talk to my students last semester Mm -hmm. and he it was such an empowering hour because he was so honest with them about the toll it's taking on him but how important it is Mm -hmm. he was he he articulated so strongly the need for the journalists to be holding the politicians accountable to be holding the the people who run the nursing homes accountable i mm-hmm. think i think scott truly was able to articulate the immense pride that he's and i mean pride in the good way i don't mean in an ego way but yep. that, it, that it, he was doing important work but he talked of course about the balance and i struggle with that because work does fulfill me. So Mm. it's not a matter of, oh, I hate my job or it's so overwhelming. So I need to step away. So, but especially during a pandemic, I have, I have burnt out probably for the first time in my career, I've burnt out. Um, So I have to actively look for ways out both inside and outside my job to, to spark that. And outside, it means being with my dogs, it means cross-country skiing, it means running, it means meditating. Um, within my job, it means engaging with my students and not looking not looking for the students who are, are active and alive and curious and engaged and pulling them out and, and creating assignments that excite me and excite the students. Um, it's easy to find the negative in any, no matter how much you love your job, right? It's easy to get burnt out. It's easy to, woe is me. Um, I, I just think it's so important to, to pull on that spark that you love and use it to keep you going and to reignite, but also recognize when it's time to step away Yeah, and, and, and whatever that means for you. Yeah. Well, I think this pandemic has introduced people to, um, it forced people to either develop you know, new coping techniques, whether that be learning how to set boundaries for yourself and for your, you know, whatever it might be, but it's, 
I think a very steep learning curve for a lot of people who get thrown like Scott or like Danielle who get thrown in the deep end who are so vigilant and so passionate about what they're doing that they it might get lost to to oh I should maybe like I've been on Twitter for 10 hours today you know like that can't be good oh there's this there's this fabulous account I follow and all it all she does is post are you doom scrolling right now go get <laughs> Like, oh yeah, I haven't had a glass of water yet today. I, and I love it. But I also I also try to be positive in that it's easy to feel oh, I work 12 hours today, that's a bad thing. But it isn't always. I get engaged and motivated and fueled by my work. So I need to make sure that I'm not making assumptions about how worn out I am, but recognizing when I truly am right. and being and being able to step away to rejuvenate. Do you think the public perception and the public appreciation for good, authentic journalism is going up now that we realize like how valuable and necessary it is when, once it gets eroded? Like you see it get eroded in the States and this is what happens, you know, like and we are not I, th I see a lot of people sort of uh, on their on our Canadian high horses, as it were, saying like, oh, that, that could never happen here. We're nothing like that. But it's not, you know, I come from a small town and it, there's not a lot of differences of opinions that you hear from the sort of left right divide. So um, I do. I you, do and yeah. I think I think there was a really good analysis after after Trump won of the mistakes that media made mm. in assumptions they made, things they didn't cover, things they dismissed as not important voices they didn't listen to. Um, I think I think there is a splinter group and I think it's louder than it is big that dismisses the media as mm -hmm. fake news. Mm -hmm. um, when I see, especially on social media, the amount, and maybe it's my echo chamber, I have a very positive echo chamber on social media, mm -hmm. but the amount of people who are following all my reporter friends on Twitter about the COVID updates, and then they plug in with, thank you for the work you're doing, mm -hmm. take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. I. I I see a rise in that. And I see, I see people recognizing that journalists aren't vultures, <laughs> that journalists care deeply. And I'm, I, I, I'm seeing a swing towards recognizing that and recognizing that journalists have to, that, are, that we are impacted by what we cover and it yeah. can be traumatic. I've always felt it's my honor and privilege to bear witness. Mm -hmm. So I may be traumatized by what I'm covering but people lived through it. <laughs> like what, like I'm, I'm removed, I'm, I'm covering it and it is, I can come home and cry my eyes out and I can internalize it. And I fortunately, I, I could turn around and become cynical, but, and I know we're going to talk about, you know, it, advice and, and life views, but one of the most important things to me is to be able to not ever be cynical. Right. So when I, I can cover, I can cover all kinds of horrible, horrible stories and I will find the joy and the peace and <laughs> the happiness in it. But ultimately a family has lived through a horrible tragedy. They're the ones who lived through it. I can, I can, I can deal with having to cover it. That is a, a tiny, tiny sliver of what they've been through. And I want to honor what they've been through by covering it. So that gets me through the hard times. Right. Yeah, that that authenticity is what makes you such an amazing teacher because it's real and you can tell that it's real. It's not, you know, it's lived. You've gone through it. You've probably interviewed thousands of people in your career. And uh, that authenticity is so important. I remember watching like an old Shaw TV uh, thing of you. And it was, some, I don't even remember what it was. It was some mundane thing, but you were just legitimately interested and it improved the interview because okay. and and thank you nolan um but i my students ask me that all the time how i gotta go cover something really boring Ugh. and i i just think how can you be bored by anything yeah that's what i say too I'm not, I'm not, i don't mean to sound like all like oh yeah but but if i'm in a bad mood and having to go cover something sure i can be but once i'm there and i meet someone and look them in the eyes and they're excited about it i get genuinely excited same. Well, my, my go-to line is everyone has a story. Like everyone you meet is going to be able to A, teach you something and B, probably like blow your mind in some way. If if you're not shutting off because you're bored or yeah. you don't want to be there, yeah. right? Like, What's that saying? You're not, you're not bored. You're boring. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes. 
Do you think after this is all, all the, sh everything's shaken down that there's going to be a sort of, let's, let's sort of shift over to, to media and books and movies and, and TV and stuff. Do you think there's going to be a somewhat of a renaissance of creativity and of writing and of performing once we can get back out there? I hope so. <laughs> I, um, I, I don't like true artists must just be hopefully you like hopefully taking care of themselves and having downtime but also oh, an explosion of but I also I when I say I, I'm not cynical one of, one of my biggest fears is that this pandemic will end in all of our little theaters and music shows mm. you, I have one just down the street I go to all the time for live music that it that it won't survive and that we will just have mega things monolithic things left as opposed to, but the amount of support I'm seeing for it and people who are like I live music is my thing so I have been paying every time I watch somebody online I send them money right like if I bought a, a ticket that's huge um, I'm buying merchandise from times changed and the park theater and and trying to support the artists and the second live music is back <laughs> if 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 I had to wear a bubble and a face mask and and be in a cone to go to folk fest <laughs> i will do it right like you can make it uh, work <laughs> so i do i i hope i hope that there's a like i shakespeare in the ruins and all the plays and like uh, shakespeare in the pub which is one of my cool favorite little hidden things to do they do they they just drink beer and sit with you in the pub and act out shakespeare is doing it online right and that all that terrified me at first online that's terrible but it's yeah you can actually really engage and do yeah. creative things online. So yeah, yeah I, there's I, been, hope, I hope so. There's been inventions of new mediums, essentially like new, like new stand up comedy stylings and like all these different things that didn't exist before because they couldn't, or they didn't have to exist before. Yeah. yeah no, it's pretty interesting to, to think about the future of, of that stuff. It's, yes. And, and I mean, I'm teaching, I keep having to stop myself when I'm teaching to say, we're just getting through this pandemic. And when we're back in the classroom, we'll go back to normal. Things are a never going back to normal again, but there's also, once I was able to not close my ears and eyes and, and stop stomping my feet about how frustrated I was. Some of the, it's teach, teaching my students to do this, to do zoom interviews yeah. is, is pretty valuable and interesting. No kidding. So, especially really, nowadays. You know, they're they're, they're My students are going to be able to, go to job interviews and say, I did pre-com in a pandemic. <laughs> yes. I sir, yeah, exactly. How many books have you read since this whole thing started? Are you reading more or less? Are you able to dig in even more so? I, I, I'm reading a lot. And I, got, I have to admit the first couple weeks of the pandemic, like back in March, I think for all of us, it was, I was just in shock and I wasn't reading as much. Um, I, I think I have three or four books on the go at the moment. <laughs> and it's a mixture of, uh, books on things that, that matter to me internally, like meditation, some nonfiction books, The Secret Life of Groceries, I have just ordered and I'm going to read. And then my good old fashioned fiction, I'm reading a, a, a book called Hamnet and Juliet, and it's a fictionalized historical account of Shakespeare's children oh, um, wow. who lived, who one of them died in the plague of 1564, 16, whatever they <laughs> Um, so I, I've got a mix of everything and I, I pop in and out and my book club is starting up again, my McNally book club online. We're doing, um, Circe oh, cool. uh, right here for our first one. Nice. Um, and then we're doing five little Indians, uh, by Michelle good in for the second one. And it's going to be virtual, which I didn't want to do at first. Cause I just thought it saps all the energy out of a conversation, but I'm mm -hmm. finding it's a different rhythm, but it's, it's doable. Yeah. I was the exact same thing with the podcast. I was like, ah, I'll just put it on hiatus until we can, you know, sit across from the table again. But, um, yeah, this is the way you have to do it. And it does, it's obviously not as good, but you know, 90% as good, not, not bad. And, and, and actually things you don't expect can come out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, as always trying to find the positive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very important. Um, so, would you say that your what what percentage of books or not percentage but when you're approaching a book for a book club 
do you read it differently than if you're just reading it for your own enjoyment or like how does that dynamic or is it the same do you read it twice if it's for the book club or like what's the what's the approach when you're doing your mcnally so much of what i read is either for book clubs or my book column on cbc that i am and i also have my own personal book clubs that um so most of what i read is going to be discussed or written about in some way so yes i am reading it looking for the threads Mm. that transcend the book to give me uh, a new view on humanity. That's basically what I'm looking for. I'm awesome. looking for a book that can tell me something new about what it means to be human or something interesting or something that makes me feel good about being human, even if it's a sad book. So when you're in these when, in these conversations, do you get surprised by how people perceive the books and stuff too, yeah? Oh, always. It's I, and anybody who's in a good book club can tell you, there's times I've picked a stinker of a book and I'm reading it with dread in my heart going, Oh my God, there's going to be 40 people at this book club tonight. And this is an awful book. And we get there and we have the best conversations, the more challenging or hard or bad, well, bad, I hate the word bad, but yeah. the, the book is sometimes the better conversations come out of it. And you know, what's interesting. And I, I'm going to put a challenge out there to anybody listening to send me some book suggestions. I, I went through a phase where I realized almost all the books I was reading were trauma based, right? Like mm. someone who had a sexual assault victim or lived through war or, and, and there was so many great life lessons and often there was beauty and hope in those books as well. But I thought I'd like to read some books that are just fun or funny. It's really hard to find those books that are also have enough depth and meat to have a good yeah. discussion about. So I'm always looking for suggestions. Right. Um, good, can, funny, hopeful books. Can anyone join the McN- your book clubs or how does this, how does it work for people who are like, I would like to be in a book club? Cause I mean, I mean, this is an opportunity now, whereas before it was probably, you know, limited to Winnipeg, but now anyone across the world can, can link up and, and give opinions. One of my friends in Brussels is going to join us in our book club. Right. Um, so the McNally book club, uh, it, it's once it, I just, I just approached McNally about 12 years ago and said, Hey, can I do a book club? And they're like, sure, you can use that bell code. Okay. <laughs> um, but McNally has been amazing. A it's free. Obviously nobody has to pay and they go out of their way to let me know if a book is available in the library. If it's, uh, if it's hardcover, they'll tell me cause they're like, a lot of people can't afford hardcover books. So this is not about McNally. McNally is not in this to make money. The mm-hmm. people who come to book club, it's free. They don't have to buy the book. Um, and McNally gives me a bunch of books to give away. So win, win, win. Yes. So the book club once a month at McNally, depending on the book, depending on the weather can be, I've had up to 50 people in book club. I've had 10. So but there's a core group of people that have been coming for 12 years and, it, and it's a mix of men, women, all abilities. Um, it's accessible. So I have, I have several people who come who use wheelchairs who come in every uh, come um, age. I have age ranged from 18 to 70 to 80 um, different nationalities, different orientations, everything. It's fabulous. Beautiful. And we've got a real rhythm going. So when we went, when the pandemic hit, and, and I was teaching online, which was so draining. I thought, I can't do this. <laughs> and a lot of people in the book club said they didn't want to go online. But yeah. McNally approached me with a, a three-month, they, they got a big grant. And um, again, not that I don't think the book club costs anything, but it was an opportunity for them to set up a Zoom thing. And um, so, yeah, they've, they've kept it at 20 people, I think, which I think is, as much as I'd love to have everybody, I think it's makes it manageable. Yeah, exactly. And people probably a little more comfortable to talk in a smaller group. Yeah. And people don't have to talk, but I find depending on the topic of the book, we have become, it, it feels like such an incredibly safe space. Mm-hmm. I have, I'm so blessed with the people who have shared really intimate and personal things and they felt comfortable doing that. And it's the book that inspired them to do it, but they felt comfortable within our space. So mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, that can often be such a you know, emotional experience when you're reading about, you know, or about something that relates to your life and stuff. But yeah, that's very cool. Or something I've, you didn't know about at all before, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you, is, were you like a little five-year-old girl running around with a book bag or what was the, have you always been a book yes. maniac? Yeah. I don't even remember learning to read. I have, uh, my, my mom read to us constantly. My older brothers and sisters read to me constantly. Um, I, 
I still have a lot of my books from, and I like this tattoo is, I don't know if you can see it. A little bit. It's, um, oh, yeah. it's the, it's uh, an illustration from the original, The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett, which is one cool. of my favorite books. Um, I have a lot, actually a lot of my tattoos are book tattoos. And yeah, as a kid going to the library, my, cause we lived out in the country. So when my dad drove in to do grocery shopping and go to, go to Canadian Tire like dads do, he'd take all five of us and he'd drop us off at the library for the day. So we would just get stacks of books and sit on the library floor and read and read and read and then take out whatever we didn't finish that day. Amazing. Um, so yeah, uh, lot, and then we were allowed, we always got books for Christmas. And the, if we were going somewhere, like we'd actually, I grew up in Ottawa, but we'd come to Winnipeg to visit my aunt. And so we were allowed a book. We were allowed to go to the store and buy a book, like the most yeah. exciting thing ever. Um, so yeah, books were a huge part of my, they still are, but like my parents raised us on books. We all like, I would sit and read, if, if, if I didn't have a book to read, I'd just pull one of the encyclopedias down and, <laughs> and read it. Like, well, it's, su it's such an interesting, um, like personality developer almost. Like people who read, I mean, not to be, not to paint with a, such a wide brush, but like well-read people are very interesting to talk to. They have different, per you, you can experience different perspectives without traveling across the world, you know, like it's a very interesting kind and, and obviously it's a privilege to be able to go to other countries. So like, if you can read, you can also learn stories from different perspectives yeah. and, and sort of advance your own uh, knowledge in that way, as opposed to living, you know, like. Absolutely. And, and whether it's graphic novels or audio books, I've gotten into audiobooks. They're so good now. Yeah, I it's, love them. Oh my god! And I real I I wasn't into them before. I wish I had been because when I read Bruce Springsteen's autobiography and and I found out he he narrated it. Oh yeah, that'd Bruce be perfect. Springsteen's voice in my ear. Um, <laughs> or Michelle Obama narrated, and I think Barack Obama, of course, reads his own book. And I'm like, why wouldn't yeah. you want to read? Um, but I. I mean, I always joke that I could be a Jeopardy champion just because I read, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the stuff you learn about history, about geography, about human interaction and dynamics. And, and I, I do, I, I, there are people who are not readers and they get that other ways. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I don't think reading is the only way. And, yeah. but I do, it's, it's one of the number one things I encourage my students to do is read. Yeah. And read outside of your comfort zone. I, I make them read different stories every week that I post. And often I'll post sp sports or political stories because they're like, I don't like sports. I'm like, really? Read this story. Mm -hmm. you know? and well, anyway. yeah, along the sort of same vein, how are, how are you encouraging people to, you, you mentioned your um, you know, social media bubble. How are you encouraging people to be aware of that? and and read stories from perspectives that they may not not even that they don't uh understand but that they actively maybe push away because they don't think that that's worth anything to them and you know there's such a divide culturally how how can you you know gently tell people to expand their horizons even to who they might consider uh, an enemy in today's world i think that's a really really important point and I, I think social media is actually a great place for that. I've come across so many writers that I never would have heard about. And I make a point of if, if I come across a writer with a voice I hadn't heard before, I go to their Twitter feed and I start following the people they follow. Mm -hmm. um, so that's opened up a whole world for me. And if, I mean, I, I guess bottom line, you're either engaged and curious and open to that kind of suggestion or you're not. Um, I do, I, I have my students read, like right now they're reading, um, it's like I know exactly by the color where the book <laughs> is. They're reading um, Seven Fallen Feathers, which, I, which is the book we did for the Winnipeg Book Club Foundation. I have my students read this every year. And, and I, I, I certainly have indigenous, indigenous students and students with indigenous background, and they will have learned some of this in high school and university courses but this book is just this is real people and it's gut-wrenching and they learn so their eyes are like Whoa. and part of the assignment with that is okay take this book but research other things that you can read and other authors and 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 people that you can read and follow and amplify those voices right yeah. retweet them recommend them to people i went through this whole year i made a point of only and 
I, I don't, I'm sure somebody could criticize me for this and say that it, it, it doesn't, it's not impactful the way I hoped it would be. And I think it was, I only read um, books by women of color for the CBC. So all my books for the six or seven months were, I actually, I don't remember how long, but mm -hmm. I, and I realized how easy it is to skip over the author's name that you don't recognize or you can't, you don't mm. think you can pronounce or comes from a country that you don't think you're that interested in and stick with what you're comfortable with. And it was, I mean, I certainly do read outside my comfort zone without this, but I forced myself to read outside my comfort zone and not just books about race issues. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite books that I read was, a, um, it was a, a murder thriller out of Nigeria, uh, I read a lot of horror and sci-fi books by women of color and Crazy. it's like, Oh yeah. The whole world that everybody on this planet has interact. Like it, the, science fiction isn't relegated to white men. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so that was, that blew my mind. It was really, really positively eye opening. Um, and just getting that, that other voices matter, not just, in the issue of race itself. Mm -hmm. But I want, like as a journalist, I, I say to I, I I say it's important. It's important if there's a if we're doing a story on an indigenous issue, of course it's indigenous voices. Mm -hmm. But if we're doing an ish a, a, a story on cancer or shopping or knitting, why why am I not why don't I have, why should we have an indigenous doctor in there? or somebody who uses a cane like it, they shouldn't only we shouldn't only be interviewing them about ability issues yeah right like yeah it everybody's part of this community and it it is really important as journalists not to be focused on just people who look and sound like you yeah i think that's why that's why it's such an exciting time to be a journalist as you were mentioning is that there are so many um voices now that because of you know their little camera recording device you know everyone can tell a story with the technology now and it's really exciting to see that yeah i mean i do obviously i am a trained journalist and i'm training journalists so i do think that that there is huge value in how much that's opened up in citizen journalism but there's also oh, the, the, something yeah. with, with the framework of training on how to take information and and reiterated in a concise compelling and accurate oh my god way. that's i think that's a that's a pandemic in itself the average person's inability to discern truth from yeah. opinion and the average person's inability to understand what a credible source is like i get sent links yeah. weekly from people that are i'm just like how do you think that this is real oh like <laughs> Know, like, you know, don't believe I, I, it's it's very funny because one of the first things we were taught back when I was however old, 10 years old, going on the Internet for the first time, it's like, don't trust anything anyone says on the Internet. Like, don't trust any. No one is who they say they are, all this stuff. But then all of a sudden now it's like people are just taking anything for at face value. Like, oh, well, I guess this is there, truth. I mean, there's there's actual steps, of course, you can take to source that something's credible. Right. But one of, someone told me this once and I thought, this is so true. If you're reading something on the internet that's inflaming you, that's making you go, oh my, then step back and have a look at where it's coming from. Because yes. it's, it's there to inflame you, Yeah, which means it's not there to actually impart the truth. Yeah, I've, yeah, exactly. If you're having an emotional reaction to something, think about the art or the writer's intent. Is that their yeah, intent? And emotion is good, obviously, but it's, sure. the, it's the extreme. It's the inflaming yeah. you. That, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I still, want, I want to talk about your, one of your other causes, um, oh. and animals and like yeah, how much, you, you talk about that, you? cause I mean, we, one of my favorite projects that we worked on is the humane society's telethon. You do a live telethon. Was it eight hours, 12 hours? I don't know. It was nine hours. Cause nine I, hours? I did that before I became a teacher. I would host and produce it okay. with my, with Jeff Bromley and others at Shaw TV. And then when I became a teacher, I wanted to continue doing it. Cause it was a big fun, not only a big fundraiser but awareness, like behind yeah. the scenes of all the work they do. Um, so uh, I started teaching and Tracy, my, my supervisor came and said, you have to teach an elective next semester. The teacher before you taught sports journalism. And I'm like, what? <laughs> do I have to teach that? She goes, no, teach whatever you want. And I'm like, telethon. 
yeah. have the students produce the telethon. I, I loved it. And I think, I think you guys did too. It's a wild day for sure. But where did your passion for dogs specifically, but maybe all animals come from? From reporting. Cause you, a lot of people, people know I'm a, a huge animal. I have two dogs and people know I'm a huge, huge, huge animal supporter. What a lot of people don't know about me is that I didn't like dogs for a long time. I dogs really grossed me out. Oh, wow. Like, they lick their bums. Yeah, and then lick your face. Oh. Yeah, and, and they got fleas and dog <laughs> hair and blah, they drool. And I, 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 I didn't want a dog, and I wasn't scared of them. If somebody had a dog, I certainly would pet it. I had nothing against that, but I did not want a dog in my house for sure. Like dog hair, no. <laughs> and now I'm absolutely covered. I don't even notice. But I started at, I had been at CTV and I moved over to a hosting producing position at, at Shaw. And I actually created, helped, the, uh, helped create the channel, the, what the show was. And I wanted to find something I could do as a weekly segment that mattered, that impacted. So Humane Society was right down the road let's do a weekly dog or animal segment. And my, my camera person at the time, Jeff Romney will tell you, I would be on camera going, this dog's so beautiful, it needs a home. And the minute the cameras are off, I was like, oh, like I go over and wash my hands, like, oh. And, uh, but, and I'm, this is probably gonna make me a little emotional. Just uh, dogs are the most joyous creatures you will ever meet. And I fell in love with the dogs there and the staff because the staff, are the hugest advocates for animals and what they see and what they go through and that they still come out positive. They work so hard on these animals behalf. I, I, they are my heroes, the people who work and volunteer at Winnipeg Humane Society. So I would be doing, and this, this, this works perfectly into our whole topic of, of, of staying positive. I would do stories, the most heartbreaking stories, Nolan, of animals that had been beaten or shot at or attacked or poisoned. And you just, you, it, it could make you cynical, but then you see this dog that's been through all this, look at you and be like, <laughs> and trust you. The dog trusts you, especially after training from the Humane Society staff. So I did a story one day on a dog uh, named Mia that they had classified as a pit bull. So she couldn't be adopted in Winnipeg. So I did the interview and said, you know, for our viewers outside of Winnipeg, or if you have family outside of Winnipeg, someone needs to adopt this dog. She's just so sweet. And a month later, Mia's still there. No one's adopted her. So I do a second interview and I'm loving her. And so I, I made arrangement. I had, I got an expert to come in and examine her. And he said, without a doubt, she's a boxer. I'm like, great. I can do a third interview and someone will be in Winnipeg can adopt her. But I started to cry and I was like, but I don't, I want to adopt her. <laughs> so I, my partner at the time and I went and got her and brought her home. It was my, my, my sister had had dogs growing up. I don't even remember them really, other than we had, well, we had a three-legged dog named Bobby that was adorable. He didn't, <laughs> he didn't count as a dog. He was a human. Um, so it brought Mia home and I just, the overwhelming wave of love and responsibility that I felt for this animal, I can't even put into words. I just... I, I mean, I can remember staying up at night when I didn't think she wasn't feeling well and just holding her paw all night, right? Like, oh, Mia, are you going to be okay? <laughs> and then we had Mia for two years and realized that she was lonely. So we went and back to the Humane Society and another dog that had a heartbreaking story and brought Jackson home. And the two of them are best friends. And I have two dogs now. And I will... I will fight for every dog on this planet to, to have a home. Well, yeah, your social media is just like, hey, there's, well, I have, so my partner, Steph, and I are also, I have probably six messages from her a week of her just sending me like Winnipeg Pet Rescue, like this one maybe? Yeah. And I'm like, we don't, we, we aren't allowed pets at our place. When we get a place, I would love a dog. But she is just like, she just, I can see her on her Instagram, whatever, just like looks up at me and like makes a little face. This I'm one? Like, this one? And, we, and I, I always think, oh, the kind of, like, I love greyhounds. I think they're the most beautiful dog, but ultimately whatever dog needs you is the perfect dog for you. Mm -hmm. There's no perfect dog that you're waiting for. It's the dog that looks at you and needs you to take it home. Exactly. For sure. 
Well, we're getting towards the end of the hour, and at the end of our time together, we do a little segment called Just Because, where I ask you about causes that you care about and the effect that it's had on your lives. You, you okay to do that? Absolutely. All right. Question one is, what is the very first cause you actually ever remember caring about? It wasn't animals, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I never thought of books as a cause. Well, literacy, literacy and literacy. Yeah. And I did, I volunteered as a teenager, uh, um, with literacy groups, but the first thing I remember being passionate about was women's rights. I remember mm -hmm. writing a letter into the editor that got published. I was very excited on how old I was about, um, women not being allowed to go topless. And I was just like, so outraged that the fact that the idea that a man couldn't control himself. Yeah is a woman's fault and she needs to cover up. And I, I remember writing this and they published it. So the idea of, of the human rights was, it was a big one for me. Um, that was a similar answer. Uh, uh, I interviewed a woman named Cynthia on the podcast and she told a story about that was her first kind of cause that she cared about too, because one of her math teachers used to staple um, hairdresser resumes onto their math tests if they didn't do well like oh go and do that and she was like excuse me like oh my god there are so many so many levels of wrong with that yeah okay, exactly right. layers layers upon yeah, layers. layers it's good that people are starting to kind of you know shed those layers <laughs> still a bit of work to do uh question two is if money and politics and logistics were no issue at all and you could just snap your fingers in support of your current cause what what would you do to sort of change the world in that way well it would be, there's so many good answers to that um, and so many ways to help people. But I'll say in a selfish way, what I would do is buy the biggest plot of land in the world and hire a bunch of amazing people and every single dog and hey, donkey, chicken, pig, whatever, that needs a safe place to blossom and live a good life. I, can do that. I would have, I would, I would like a, there's a, there's this person on Instagram, Wolfgang. If you look that word up, you'll find him. It's Wolf. He adopts every old animal at the shelter and he's got pigs and turkeys and probably 12 senior dogs. And it's hilarious and I love him and, and I want to be him. Okay. And I wish I could just have a place for them to run and run and run and have staff that took care of their behavior needs and their medical needs. I'm looking out the window as though I had this outside. <laughs> um, and I realize that's also a selfish wish because it would be heaven for me. That's okay. That's allowed. Uh, question, question three is what's the biggest misunderstanding or stigma about your cause? Well, if I, I mean, I, I think you and I, there's so many causes that, you know, journalism, books, literacy, all of that. But if we're going to stick to animals, um, probably that rescue dogs need more training and that mm. our, that a rescue dog could be problematic if you have children, et cetera. Mm. And I, I, I know a lot of wonder, I, I, I'm not against breeders. Um, I'm against backyard breeders and puppy mills. Um, I, there's a lot of really uh, um, ethical and, and brilliant breeders. And, and I, I don't begrudge anybody who wants, but, but do that because that's what you want, not because you think rescue dogs will be a challenge or will bite you or will have temperament issues or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. My best friend's dog is a rescue and he's the coolest dog I've ever yeah. met. Like they're so cool. Question four. Uh, what is a time in your life where you had to pivot because plan A wasn't working out? So you had to go to plan B. Um, I, there's, that's my whole life. Like, I don't even know what the answer to that would be. I mean, my, my career, school, relationships, friendship, that if you're not ready to pivot, I, I, how do you live? Yeah. So honestly, I, I mean, the obvious answer is pivoting to online teaching, but I don't know that that's the biggest one in my life. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, I firmly believe that no matter how deep it, it's amazing to me, how many times I thought this is it, this is my life and mm -hmm. nothing's going to change. And a year later, I'm in an entirely different job in a different city in a different relationship. And I'm like, wow, I had no idea. I'm like, it's amazing how many times I have to learn that lesson over and over and over again. That life is pivots. Yeah. And that's exciting and, and good. Very well said. Uh, question five. What is the best piece of advice that you've ever been given? You know, I've been given so much good advice. I have so many amazing people in my life. 
and for the second time, I might shed I, I, a, a very, very, um, one of my mentors died this week. And mm -hmm. so I've been thinking a lot about him. And he, uh, Bob Mackishon, who was uh, my director at CTV and also the dad of one of my best friends and Jill Mackishon, who's a national reporter. And I, he taught me everything about being a producer and, and being a decent human being. So I could go on and on and on about the advice he gave me. But one of the things that stuck out was I remember just sitting around the newsroom one day, like 20 years ago and saying, oh my God, I cannot wait for my holidays. Hmm. And Bob just looked at me and I think it was an off the cuff comment, but he just said, don't waste your life waiting for things. Just live, live what you're living. That has stuck with me forever. And it's a hard, it's harder than you would think, but I, I'm trying not to live my life anticipating anything. I, I think anticipation is fun and joyous, but, but life right now is important. So mm -hmm. that was a really important piece of advice. Thank oh, you, Bob. Yeah. I'm sorry for your loss for sure. I, I, I think about that all the time as far as like, oh, I can't wait for the weekend or I can't wait for what, you know, whatever. Like, why don't you just enjoy your, like, if, if something, I mean, maybe that's a privilege of mine that I've been able to have a pretty comfortable and enjoyable life and not any like crappy, crappy, terrible jobs. But yeah, it's always, it's, it's been hard for me to, to connect with people who are always like, oh, I can't wait to get out of here. It's like, well, why even, well, what, I, just yeah. change it, I, like pivot, yes. you know? And, and I mean, it's one of the things I, that I, I work on with students who, oh, this program. And I'm like, well, this is a privilege to be in this program. And it should, you should be here because you love it and it's exciting. And of course, everyone has bad days and bad, of course. Yeah. But as an overall thing, I always want to enjoy and appreciate where I am right now. And if I'm not, figure out why not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Question six. What advice would you give your 10-year-old self if you could talk to her right now? You know what? I thought about that one. And I hope you don't think this is a cop-out because I mean it sincerely. I wouldn't give my 10 year old any advice. Um, I thought about it a lot. And A, I, again, I had lots of my parents, my sisters, I had so many amazing role models that, that helped shape me. And there's definitely things I wish I'd done differently. And I wish I'd not, like, I wish I hadn't worried so much in high school about what people thought, good mm -hmm, Lord. Mm -hmm. um, but that shaped me in who I am. So I would ultimately say, I would just say to my 10 year old, as you were. You got this. Yeah. Yeah. I love that answer. I think that's a very, I, I think that's a deeper, like more profound level than saying like, Oh, you know, don't care about what people think of you. Cause that's gonna like, no, we were told that, you know, like a lot of things that we would go back and I say. Got, I got to, apply, I mean, of course I still struggle with caring what people think, but it took me to my fifties to fully let go of that. And I can't give that up. I can't give up all that 50 years of learning to let that go. That made me who I am. Yeah. It took me to some really cool places. So Heck yeah. Well, Joanne, last question. Thank you very much for doing this. I always love talking. Every time I talk to you, I walk away being like, all right, the world is going to be okay. So thank Nolan, you for this conversation. I feel, I feel the exact same way about you. You well, were a thanks. joy in class. You made me think. You kept me on my toes. And I love that. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I know what I'm going to remember you for, but what do you want to be remembered for? There's so many things I'd like to say, being adventurous, being funny, being this, but honestly, probably just being kind. Mm. I, and I'm working on that all the time because it's kind sounds like a, a boring word, but I hope people remember, I hope people remember me with a smile and that I was kind. And I hope in the times where I haven't been kind, people can forgive me, can forgive me. I've never seen you be unkind. So, I mean, there we go. Joanne Kelly, thank you for being on the podcast. Uh, where can people find out more about your book clubs and everything that you're doing? Just uh, social media or where's the best best place? Social media, all my social media is open and uh, Twitter is Joanne M. Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y. And McNally has everything listed for the book clubs. But I, I, I use my Twitter to tweet about um, cool stuff my students are doing and books. Yeah. So if you it, that would be a good place to connect it's a good follow for sure if you like see well that dog that you tweeted today that little 12 year old with the tongue out I know. <laughs> and they say she still gets the zoomies that she's full of energy so i hope she's been adopted adorable love it joanne thank you very much for being here uh, we'll talk to you again soon okay bye-bye